Section twenty two of The Scarlet Letter. Chapter nineteen. The Child at the Brookside. Thou wilt love her dearly, repeated Hester Prynne, as she and the minister sat watching little Pearl. Dost thou not think her beautiful, and see with what natural skill she has made those simple flowers adorn her? Had she gathered pearls and diamonds and rubies in the wood, they could not have become her better. She is a splendid child. But I know whose brow she has." "'Dost thou know, Hester,' said Arthur Dimsdale, with an unquiet smile, "'that this dear child, tripping about always at thy side, hath caused me many an alarm. Methought, O oh Hester, what a thought is that, and how terrible to dread it, that my own features were partly repeated in her face, and so strikingly that the world might see them. But she is mostly thine." "'No, no, not mostly,' answered the mother, with a tender smile. "'A little longer, and thou needest not to be afraid to trace whose child she is. But how strangely beautiful she looks, with those wild flowers in her hair! It is as if one of the fairies, whom we left in our dear old England, had decked her out to meet us. It was with a feeling which neither of them had ever before experienced, that they sat and watched Pearl's slow advance. In her was visible the tie that united them. She had been offered to the world, these seven years past, as the living hieroglyph, in which was revealed the secret they so darkly sought to hide, all written in this symbol, all plainly manifest, had there been a prophet or magician skilled to read the character of flame and Pearl was the oneness of their being. Be the foregone evil what it might, how could they doubt that their earthly lives and future destinies were conjoined, when they beheld at once the material union, and the spiritual idea, in whom they met, and were to dwell immortally together? Thoughts like these, and perhaps other thoughts, which they did not acknowledge or define, threw an awe about the child, as she came onward. Let her see nothing strange, no passion nor eagerness, in thy way of accosting her," whispered Hester. Our Pearl is a fitful and fantastic little elf sometimes, especially she is seldom tolerant of emotion, when she does not fully comprehend the why and wherefore. But the child hath strong affections, she loves me, and will love thee." "'Thou canst not think,' said the minister, glancing aside at Hester Prynne, how my heart dreads this interview, and yearns for it. But in truth, as I already told thee, children are not readily won to be familiar with me. They will not climb my knee, nor prattle in my ear, nor answer to my smile, but stand apart and eye me strangely. Even little babes, when I take them in my arms, weep bitterly. Yet Pearl, twice in her little lifetime, hath been kind to me. The first time, thou knowest it well. The last was when thou ledst her with thee to the house of yonder stern old governor. And thou didst plead so bravely in her behalf and mine," answered the mother. I remember it, and so shall little Pearl. Fear nothing. She may be strange and shy at first, but will soon learn to love thee." By this time Pearl had reached the margin of the brook, and stood on the farther side gazing silently at Hester and the clergyman, who still sat together on the mossy tree-trunk, waiting to receive her. Just where she had paused, the brook chanced to form a pool, so smooth and quiet that it reflected a perfect image of her little figure, with all the brilliant picturesqueness of her beauty, in its adornment of flowers and wreathed foliage, but more refined and spiritualized than the reality. This image, so nearly identical with the living pearl, seemed to communicate somewhat of its own shadowy and intangible quality to the child herself. It was strange, the way in which Pearl stood, looking so steadfastly at them through the dim medium of the forest gloom, herself, meanwhile, all glorified with a ray of sunshine, that was attracted thitherward as by a certain sympathy. In the brook beneath stood another child another and the same, 
with likewise its ray of golden light. Esther felt herself, in some indistinct and tantalizing manner, estranged from Pearl, as if the child, in her lonely ramble through the forest, had strayed out of the sphere in which she and her mother dwelt together, and was now vainly seeking to return to it. There was both truth and error in the impression. The child and mother were estranged, but through Hester's fault, not Pearl's. Since the latter rambled from her side, another inmate had been admitted within the circle of the mother's feelings, and so modified the aspect of them all, that Pearl, the returning wanderer, could not find her wanted place, and hardly knew where she was. "'I have a strange fancy,' observed the sensitive minister, "'that this brook is the boundary between two worlds, and that thou canst never meet thy Pearl again. Or is she an elfish spirit, who, as the legends of our childhood taught us, is forbidden to cross a running stream? Pray hasten her, for this delay has already imparted a tremor to my nerves." "'Come, dearest child,' said Hester encouragingly, and stretching out both her arms. "'How slow thou art! When hast thou been so sluggish before now? Here is a friend of mine, who must be thy friend also. Thou wilt have twice as much love, henceforward, as thy mother alone could give thee. Leap across the brook and come to us. Thou canst leap like a young deer." Pearl, without responding in any manner to these honey-sweet expressions, remained on the other side of the brook. Now she fixed her bright, wild eyes on her mother, now on the minister, and now included them both in the same glance, as if to detect and explain to herself the relation which they bore to one another. For some unaccountable reason, as Arthur Dimsdale felt the child's eyes upon himself, his hand, with that gesture so habitual as to have become involuntary, stole over his heart. At length, assuming a singular air of authority, Pearl stretched out her hand, with the small forefinger extended, and pointing evidently towards her mother's breast. And beneath, in the mirror of the brook, there was the flower-girdled and sunny image of little Pearl, pointing her small forefinger too. "'Thou strange child! Why dost thou not come to me?' exclaimed Hester. Pearl still pointed with her forefinger, and a frown gathered on her brow, the more impressive from the childish, the almost baby-like aspect of the features that conveyed it. As her mother still kept beckoning to her, and arraying her face in a holiday suit of unaccustomed smiles, the child stamped her foot with a yet more imperious look and gesture. In the brook again was the fantastic beauty of the image, with its reflected frown, its pointed finger, and imperious gesture, giving emphasis to the aspect of little Pearl. "'Hasten, Pearl, or I shall be angry with thee!' cried Hester Prynne, who, however inured to such behaviour on the elf-child's part at other seasons, was naturally anxious for a more seemly deportment now. "'Leap across the brook, naughty child, and run hither, else I must come to thee!' But Pearl, not a whit startled at her mother's threats, any more than mollified by her entreaties, now suddenly burst into a fit of passion, gesticulating violently, and throwing her small figure into the most extravagant contortions. She accompanied this wild outbreak with piercing shrieks, which the woods reverberated on all sides, so that, alone as she was in her childish and unreasonable wrath, it seemed as if a hidden multitude were lending her their sympathy and encouragement. Seen in the brook once more was the shadowy wrath of Pearl's image, crowned and girdled with flowers, but stamping its foot, wildly gesticulating, and, in the midst of all, still pointing its small forefinger at Hester's bosom. "'I see what ails the child,' whispered Hester to the clergyman, and turning pale in spite of a strong effort to conceal her trouble and annoyance. "'Children will not abide any, the slightest change, in the accustomed aspect of things that are daily before their eyes. Pearl misses something which she has always seen me wear." "'I pray you,' answered the minister, 
if thou hast any means of pacifying the child, do it forthwith. Save it were the cankered wrath of an old witch like Mistress Hibbins," added he, attempting to smile. I know nothing that I would not sooner encounter than this passion in a child. In Pearl's young beauty, as in the wrinkled witch, it has a preternatural effect. Pacify her, if thou lovest me." Hester turned again towards Pearl, with a crimson blush upon her cheek, a conscious glance aside at the clergyman, and then a heavy sigh. While, even before she had time to speak, the blush yielded to a deadly pallor. "'Pearl,' said she, sadly, "'look down at thy feet. There, before thee, on the hither side of the brook.' The child turned her eyes to the point indicated, and there lay the scarlet letter, so close upon the margin of the stream that the gold embroidery was reflected in it. "'Bring it hither,' said Hester. "'Come thou and take it up,' answered Pearl. "'Was ever such a child?' observed Hester, aside to the minister. Oh, I have much to tell thee about her. But, in very truth, she is right as regards this hateful token. I must bear its torture yet a little longer, only a few days longer, until we shall have left this region, and look back hither as to a land which we have dreamed of. The forest cannot hide it. The mid-ocean shall take it from my hand and swallow it up for ever. With these words she advanced to the margin of the brook, took up the scarlet letter, and fastened it again into her bosom. Hopefully, but a moment ago, as Hester had spoken of drowning it in the deep sea, there was a sense of inevitable doom upon her, as she thus received back this deadly symbol from the hand of fate. She had flung it into infinite space, she had drawn an hour's free breath, and here again was the scarlet misery glittering on the old spot. So it ever is, whether thus typified or no, that an evil deed invests itself with the character of doom. Hester next gathered up the heavy tresses of her hair, and confined them beneath her cap. As if there were a withering spell in the sad letter, her beauty, the warmth and richness of her womanhood, departed like fading sunshine, and a grey shadow seemed to fall across her. When the dreary change was wrought, she extended her hand to Pearl. "'Dost thou know thy mother now, child?' asked she reproachfully, but with a subdued tone. "'Wilt thou come across the brook, and own thy mother, now that she has her shame upon her, now that she is sad?' "'Yes, now I will,' answered the child bounding across the brook, and clasping Hester in her arms. "'Now thou art my mother indeed, and I am thy little Pearl!' In a mood of tenderness that was not usual with her, she drew down her mother's head, and kissed her brow and both her cheeks. But then, by a kind of necessity that always impelled this child to alloy whatever comfort she might chance to give with a throb of anguish, Pearl put up her mouth, and kissed the scarlet letter, too. "'That was not kind,' said Hester. "'When thou hast shown me a little love, thou mockest me.' "'Why doth the minister sit yonder?' asked Pearl. "'He waits to welcome thee,' replied her mother. "'Come thou, and entreat his blessing. He loves thee, my little Pearl, and loves thy mother, too. Wilt thou not love him?' Come, he longs to greet thee. Doth he love us? said Pearl, looking up with acute intelligence into her mother's face. Will he go back with us, hand in hand, we three together, into the town? Not now, dear child, answered Hester. But in days to come he will walk hand in hand with us. We will have a home and fireside of our own, and thou shalt sit upon his knee and he will teach thee many things, and love thee dearly. Thou wilt love him, wilt thou not?" "'And will he always keep his hand over his heart?' inquired Pearl. "'Foolish child, what a question is that!' exclaimed her mother. "'Come and ask his blessing.' But, whether influenced by the jealousy that seems instinctive with every petted child towards a dangerous rival, 
or from whatever caprice of her freakish nature, Pearl would show no favour to the clergyman. It was only by an exertion of force that her mother brought her up to him, hanging back and manifesting her reluctance by odd grimaces, of which, ever since her babyhood, she had possessed a singular variety, and could transform her mobile physiognomy into a series of different aspects, with a new mischief in them, each and all. The minister, painfully embarrassed, but hoping that a kiss might prove a talisman to admit him into the child's kindlier regards, bent forward and impressed one on her brow. Hereupon Pearl broke away from her mother, and, running to the brook, stooped over it and bathed her forehead, until the unwelcome kiss was quite washed off, and diffused through a long lapse of the gliding water. She then remained apart, silently watching Hester and the clergyman, while they talked together and made such arrangements as were suggested by their new position, and the purposes soon to be fulfilled. And now this fateful interview had come to a close. The dell was to be left a solitude among its dark, old trees, which, with their multitudinous tongues, would whisper long of what had passed there, and no mortal be the wiser and the melancholy brook would add this other tale to the mystery with which its little heart was already overburdened, and whereof it still kept up a murmuring babble, with not a whit more cheerfulness of tone than for ages heretofore. End of section 22— Section 23 of The Scarlet Letter Chapter 20 — The Minister in a Maze as the minister departed, in advance of Hester Prynne and little Pearl, he threw a backward glance, half expecting that he should discover only some faintly traced features or outline of the mother and the child, slowly fading into the twilight of the woods. So great a vicissitude in his life could not at once be received as real. But there was Hester, clad in her grey robe, still standing beside the tree-trunk, which some blast had overthrown a long antiquity ago, and which time had ever since been covering with moss, so that these two fated ones, with earth's heaviest burden on them, might there sit down together, and find a single hour's rest and solace. And there was Pearl, too, lightly dancing from the margin of the brook, now that the intrusive third person was gone, and taking her old place by her mother's side so the minister had not fallen asleep and dreamed. In order to free his mind from this indistinctness and duplicity of impression, which vexed with a strange disquietude, he recalled and more thoroughly defined the plans which Hester and himself had sketched for their departure. It had been determined between them that the old world, with its crowds and cities, offered them a more eligible shelter and concealment than the wilds of New England, or all America, with its alternatives of an Indian wigwam, or the few settlements of Europeans scattered thinly along the seaboard. Not to speak of the clergyman's health, so inadequate to sustain the hardships of a forest life, his native gifts, his culture, and his entire development, would secure him home only in the midst of civilization and refinement, the higher the state, the more delicately adapted to it the man. In furtherance of this choice, it so happened that a ship lay in the harbour, one of those questionable cruisers, frequent at that day, which, without being absolutely outlaws of the deep, yet roamed over its surface with a remarkable irresponsibility of character. This vessel had recently arrived from the Spanish main, and, within three days' time, would sail for Bristol. Hester Prynne whose vocation as a self-enlisted sister of charity had brought her acquainted with the captain and crew, could take upon herself to secure the passage of two individuals and a child, with all the secrecy which circumstances rendered more than desirable. The minister had inquired of Hester, with no little interest, the precise time at which the vessel might be expected to depart. It would probably be on the fourth day from the present. That is most fortunate he had then said to himself. Now, why the Reverend Mr. Dimsdale considered it so very fortunate, we hesitate to reveal. Nevertheless, to hold nothing back from the reader, 
it was because, on the third day from the present, he was to preach the election sermon, and, as such an occasion formed an honourable epoch in the life of a New England clergyman, he could not have chanced upon a more suitable mode and time of terminating his professional career. At least they shall say of me, thought this exemplary man, that I leave no public duty unperformed, nor ill-performed. Sad, indeed, that an introspection so profound and acute as this poor minister's should be so miserably deceived. We have had, and may still have, worse things to tell of him, but none, we apprehend, so pitiably weak, no evidence, at once so slight and irrefragible, of a subtle disease, that had long since begun to eat into the real substance of his character. No man, for any considerable period, can wear one face to himself, and another to the multitude, without finally getting bewildered as to which may be the true. The excitement of Mr. Dimsdale's feelings, as he returned from his interview with Hester, lent him unaccustomed physical energy, and hurried him townward at a rapid pace. The pathway among the woods seemed wilder, more uncouth with its rude natural obstacles, and less trodden by the foot of man, than he remembered it on his outward journey. But he leaped across the plashy places, thrust himself through the clinging underbrush, climbed the ascent, plunged into the hollow, and overcame, in short, all the difficulties of the track, with an unweariable activity that astonished him. He could not but recall how feebly, and with what frequent pauses for breath, he had toiled over the same ground only two days before. As he drew near the town, he took an impression of change from the series of familiar objects that presented themselves. It seemed not yesterday, not one nor two, but many days, or even years ago, since he had quitted them. There, indeed, was each former trace of the street, as he remembered it, and all the peculiarities of the houses, with the due multitude of gable-peaks, and a weathercock at every point where his memory suggested one. Not the less, however, came this importunately obtrusive sense of change. The same was true as regarded the acquaintances whom he met, and all the well-known shapes of human life about the little town. They looked neither older nor younger now, the beards of the aged were no whiter, nor could the creeping babe of yesterday walk on his feet to-day. It was impossible to describe in what respect they differed from the individuals on whom he had so recently bestowed a parting glance, and yet the minister's deepest sense seemed to inform him of their mutability. A similar impression struck him most remarkably as he passed under the walls of his own church. The edifice had so very strange, and yet so familiar an aspect, that Mr. Dimsdale's mind vibrated between two ideas, either that he had seen it only in a dream hitherto, or that he was merely dreaming about it now. This phenomenon, in the various shapes which it assumed, indicated no external change, but so sudden and important a change in the spectator of the familiar scene, that the intervening space of a single day had operated on his consciousness like the lapse of years. The minister's own will, and Hester's will, and the fate that grew between them had wrought this transformation. It was the same town as heretofore, but the same minister returned not from the forest. He might have said to the friends who greeted him, I am not the man for whom you take me. I left him yonder in the forest, withdrawn into a secret dell, by a mossy tree-trunk, and near a melancholy brook. Go, seek your minister, and see if his emaciated figure, his thin cheek, his white, heavy, pain-wrinkled brow, be not flung down there like a cast-off garment. His friends, no doubt, would still have insisted with him, Thou art thyself the man! But the error would have been their own, not his. Before Mr. Dimsdale reached home, his inner man gave him other evidences of a revolution in the sphere of thought and feeling. In truth, nothing short of a total change of dynasty and moral code, in that interior kingdom, was adequate to account for the impulses now communicated to the unfortunate and startled minister. At every step he was incited to do some strange, wild, wicked thing or other, with a sense that it would be at once involuntary and intentional. In spite of himself, 
yet growing out of a still profounder self than that which opposed the impulse. For instance, he met one of his own deacons. The good old man addressed him with the paternal affection and patriarchal privilege which his venerable age, his upright and holy character, and his station in the church entitled him to use. And, conjoined with this, the deep, almost worshipping respect, which the minister's professional and private claims alike demanded. Never was there a more beautiful example of how the majesty of age and wisdom may comport with the obeisance and respect enjoined upon it, as from a lower social rank and inferior order of endowment towards a higher. Now, during a conversation of some two or three moments between the Reverend Mr. Dimsdale and this excellent and hoary-bearded deacon, it was only by the most careful self-control that the former could refrain from uttering certain blasphemous suggestions that rose into his mind, respecting the communion supper. He absolutely trembled and turned pale as ashes, lest his tongue should wag itself in utterance of these horrible matters, and plead his own consent for so doing, without his having fairly given it. And, even with this terror in his heart, he could hardly avoid laughing, to imagine how the sanctified old patriarchal deacon would have been petrified by his minister's impiety. Again another incident of the same nature. Hurrying along the street, the Reverend Mr. Dimsdale encountered the eldest female member of his church, a most pious and exemplary old dame, poor, widowed, lonely, and with a heart as full of reminiscences about her dead husband and children, and her dead friends of long ago, as a burial-ground is full of storied gravestones. Yet all this, which would else have been such heavy sorrow, was made almost a solemn joy to her devout old soul, by religious consolations and the truths of Scripture, wherewith she had fed herself continually for more than thirty years. And since Mr. Dimsdale had taken her in charge, the good Grandam's chief earthly comfort, which, unless it had likewise been a heavenly comfort, could have been none at all, was to meet her pastor, whether casually or of set purpose, and be refreshed with a word of warm, fragrant, heaven-breathing gospel truth from his beloved lips into her dulled but rapturously attentive ear. But, on this occasion, up to the moment of putting his lips to the old woman's ear, Mr. Dimsdale, as the great enemy of souls would have it, could recall no text of Scripture, nor aught else, except a brief, pithy, and, as it then appeared to him, unanswerable argument against the immortality of the human soul. The instilment thereof into her mind would probably have caused this aged sister to drop down dead at once, as by the effect of an intensely poisonous infusion. What he really did whisper, the minister could never afterwards recollect. There was, perhaps, a fortunate disorder in his utterance, which failed to impart any distinct idea to the good widow's comprehension, or which Providence interpreted after a method of its own. Assuredly, as the minister looked back, he beheld an expression of divine gratitude and ecstasy, that seemed like the shine of the celestial city on her face, so wrinkled and ashy pale. Again a third instance. After parting from the old church member, he met the youngest sister of them all. It was a maiden newly won, and won by the Reverend Dimsdale's own sermon on the Sabbath after his vigil, to barter the transitory pleasures of the world for the heavenly hope that was to assume brighter substance as life grew dark around her, and which would gild the utter gloom with final glory. She was fair and pure as a lily that had bloomed in paradise. The minister knew well that he was himself enshrined within the stainless sanctity of her heart, which hung its snowy curtains about his image, imparting to religion the warmth of love, and to love a religious purity. Satan, that afternoon, had surely led the poor girl away from her mother's side, and thrown her into the pathway of this sorely tempted, or, shall we not rather say, this lost and desperate man. As she drew nigh, the arch-fiend whispered him to condense into small compass, and drop into her tender bosom, a germ of evil, that would be sure to blossom darkly soon, and bear black fruit betimes. 
such was his sense of power over this virgin soul, trusting him as she did, that the minister felt potent to blight all the field of innocence with but one wicked look, and develop all its opposite with but a word. So, with a mightier struggle than he had yet sustained, he held his Geneva cloak before his face, and hurried onward, making no sign of recognition, and leaving the young sister to digest his rudeness as she might. She ransacked her conscience, which was full of harmless little matters, like her pocket or her work-book, and took herself to task, poor thing, for a thousand imaginary faults, and went about her household duties with swollen eyelids the next morning. Before the minister had time to celebrate his victory over this last temptation, he was conscious of another impulse, more ludicrous and almost as horrible. It was, we blush to tell it, it was to stop short in the road, and teach some very wicked words to a knot of little Puritan children who were playing there, and had but just begun to talk. Denying himself this freak, as unworthy of his cloth, he met a drunken seaman, one of the ship's crew from the Spanish main. And here, since he had so valiantly forborne all other wickedness, poor Mr. Dimsdale longed, at least, to shake hands with the tarry blackguard, and recreate himself with a few improper jests, such as dissolute sailors so abound with, and volley of good, round, solid, satisfactory, and heaven-defying oaths. It was not so much a better principle, as partly his natural good taste, and still more his buckramed habit of clerical decorum, that carried him safely through the latter crisis. "'What is it that haunts and tempts me thus?' cried the minister to himself, at length, pausing in the street, and striking his hand against his forehead. "'Am I mad, or am I given over utterly to the fiend? Did I make a contract with him in the forest, and sign it with my blood? And does he now summon me to its fulfilment, by suggesting the performance of every wickedness which his most foul imagination can conceive?' At the moment when the Reverend Mr. Dimsdale thus communed with himself, and struck his forehead with his hand, old Mistress Hibbins, the reputed witch-lady, is said to have been passing by. She made a very grand appearance, having on a high head-dress, a rich gown of velvet, and a ruff done up with the famous yellow starch, of which Anne Turner, her especial friend, had taught her the secret, before this last good lady had been hanged for Sir Thomas Overbury's murder. Whether the witch had read the minister's thoughts or no, she came to a full stop, looked shrewdly into his face, smiled craftily, and, though little given to converse with clergymen, began a conversation. "'So, reverend sir, you have made a visit into the forest,' observed the witch-lady, nodding her high head-dress at him. "'The next time I pray you to allow me only a fair warning, and I shall be proud to bear you company.' Without taking over much upon myself, my good word will go far towards gaining any strange gentleman a fair reception from yonder potentate you wot of." "'I profess, madam,' answered the clergyman, with a grave obeisance, such as the lady's rank demanded, and his own good breeding made imperative, "'I profess, on my conscience and character, that I am utterly bewildered as touching the purport of your words. I went not into the forest to seek a potentate. Neither do I, at any future time, design a visit thither, with a view to gaining the favour of such a personage. My one sufficient object was to greet that pious friend of mine, the Apostle Eliot, and rejoice with him over the many precious souls he hath won from heathendom." "'Ha! ha! ha!' cackled the old witch-lady, still nodding her high head-dress at the minister. "'Well, well, we must needs talk thus in the daytime. You carry it off like an old hand but at midnight, and in the forest, we shall have other talk together." She passed on with her aged stateliness, but often turning back her head and smiling at him, like one willing to recognise a secret intimacy of connection. "'Have I then sold myself,' thought the minister, to the fiend whom, if men say true, this yellow-starched and velveted old hag has chosen for her prince and master?" The wretched minister! He had made a bargain very like it. Tempted by a dream of happiness, he had yielded himself, with deliberate choice, as he had never done before, to what he knew was deadly sin. 
and the infectious poison of that sin had been thus rapidly diffused throughout his moral system. It had stupefied all blessed impulses, and awakened into vivid life the whole brotherhood of bad ones. Scorn, bitterness, unprovoked malignity, gratuitous desire of ill, ridicule of whatever was good and holy, all awoke to tempt, even while they frightened him. And his encounter with old Mistress Hibbins, if it were a real incident, did but show his sympathy and fellowship with wicked mortals, and the world of perverted spirits. He had by this time reached his dwelling, on the edge of the burial-ground, and, hastening up the stairs, took refuge in his study. The minister was glad to have reached this shelter, without first betraying himself to the world, by any of those strange and wicked eccentricities, to which he had been continually impelled while passing through the streets. He entered the accustomed room, and looked around him on its books, its windows, its fireplace, and the tapestried comfort of the walls, with the same perception of strangeness that had haunted him throughout his walk from the forest dell into the town and thitherward. Here he had studied and written, here gone through fast and vigil, and come forth half alive, here striven to pray, here borne a hundred thousand agonies. There was the Bible, in its rich old Hebrew, with Moses and the prophets speaking to him, and God's voice through all. There, on the table, with the inky pen beside it, was an unfinished sermon, with a sentence broken in the midst, where his thoughts had ceased to gush out upon the page two days before. He knew that it was himself, the thin and white-cheeked minister, who had done and suffered these things, and written thus far into the election sermon. But he seemed to stand apart, and I this former self with scornful, pitying, but half-envious curiosity. That self was gone. Another man had returned out of the forest, a wiser one, with a knowledge of hidden mysteries which the simplicity of the former never could have reached. A bitter kind of knowledge, that! While occupied with these reflections, a knock came at the door of the study, and the minister said, Come in, not wholly devoid of an idea that he might behold an evil spirit. And so he did. It was old Roger Chillingworth that entered. The minister stood white and speechless, with one hand on the Hebrew scriptures, and the other spread upon his breast. "'Welcome home, reverend sir,' said the physician. "'And how found you that godly man, the Apostle Eliot? But methinks, dear sir, you look pale, as if the travel through the wilderness had been too sore for you. Will not my aid be requisite to put you in heart and strength to preach your election sermon?' "'Nay, I think not so,' rejoined the reverend Mr. Dimsdale. My journey, and the sight of the holy apostle yonder, and the free air which I have breathed, have done me good, after so long confinement in my study. I think to need no more of your drugs, my kind physician, good though they be, and administered by a friendly hand." All this time Roger Chillingworth was looking at the minister with the grave and intent regard of a physician towards his patient. But, in spite of this outward show, the latter was almost convinced of the old man's knowledge, or at least his confident suspicion, with respect to his own interview with Hester Prynne. The physician knew, then, that, in the minister's regard, he was no longer a trusted friend, but his bitterest enemy. So much being known, it would appear natural that a part of it should be expressed. It is singular, however, how long a time often passes, before words embody things, and with what security two persons, who choose to avoid a certain subject, may approach its very verge, and retire without disturbing it. Thus the minister felt no apprehension that Roger Chillingworth would touch, in express words, upon the real position which they sustained towards one another. Yet did the physician, in his dark way, creep frightfully near the secret. "'Were it not better,' said he, that you may use my poor skill to-night. Verily, dear sir, we must make pains to make you strong and vigorous for this occasion of the election discourse. The people look for great things from you, apprehending that another year may come about, and find their pastor gone." 
"'Yea, to another world,' replied the minister, with pious resignation. "'Heaven grant it be a better one, for, in sooth, I hardly think to tarry with my flock through the flitting seasons of another year. But, touching your medicine, kind sir, in my present frame of body, I need it not. I joy to hear it," answered the physician. It may be that my remedies, so long administered in vain, begin now to take due effect. Happy man were I, and well deserving of New England's gratitude, could I achieve this cure. I thank you from my heart, most watchful friend," said the Reverend Mr. Dimsdale, with a solemn smile. I thank you, and can but requite your good deeds with my prayers. A good man's prayers are golden recompense," rejoined old Roger Chillingworth, as he took his leave. Yea, they are the current gold coin of the New Jerusalem, with the King's own mint-mark on them." Left alone, the minister summoned a servant of the house, and requested food, which, being set before him, he ate with ravenous appetite. Then, flinging the already written pages of the election sermon into the fire, he forthwith began another which he wrote with such an impulsive flow of thought and emotion that he fancied himself inspired, and only wondered that heaven should see fit to transmit the grand and solemn music of its oracles through so foul an organ-pipe as he. However, leaving that mystery to solve itself, or go unsolved for ever, he drove his task onward with earnest haste and ecstasy. Thus the night fled away, as if it were a winged steed, and he careering on it, Morning came and peeped, blushing through the curtains, and at last sunrise threw a golden beam into the study, and laid it right across the minister's bedazzled eyes. There he was, with a pen still between his fingers, and a vast immeasurable tract of written space behind him. End of section 23